I feel like I'm a star. I love this stage. Um, so, uh, I, um, I was uh, lucky enough to be involved in some pretty big startups over the last few years. And I used to be um, part of a big uh, VC firm called Horizons Ventures, which is out of Hong Kong. And for that, I was, uh, I was uh, privileged enough to be on the board of uh, Siri before we sold that to Apple and, and Spotify from the early days when my butcher was talking about Spotify scaling out. We were the first uh, VC firm, um, my previous one, Horizons, to go into Spotify when they were um, only in Sweden. And, uh, and so watching those guys scale out and go through it was pretty cool as well. And I also um, was on a lot of boards and other boards as well, but I was also on the board of a company called Sumley. Uh, and Sumley was started by a 15-year-old in, um, in Wimbledon in London. And uh, we found uh, this kid, Nick Delacio. And Nick um, had been coding since he was about 10. He was Australian originally and then moved to London when he was seven. And I'm Australian as well, so it was a bit of, bit of pride there. And um, Nick, was, Nick, was, um, Nick had started building apps when he was uh, 12. And by the time he got to 14, he'd already made $30,000 out, um, out of his apps. And um, just like any other 14, 15-year-old, he took that $30,000 and he went and hired a couple of um, natural language experts, NLP experts in Israel and a professor in MIT at the age of 15 from his bedroom because he's still at school, he wasn't able to go down to Israel, he wasn't able to go down to Boston, <laughs> right? So he goes and has the balls to go and hire them, right? And what he did is he actually went out and said, I've got this idea about summarization and automatic summarization of text. And he went out and um, he said, right, I need to find an expert. So he, he looked at all the papers in summarization and he looked at who were the, the lead authors on the papers and he literally pinged them. And you can imagine them like, finding out that this kid who was incredibly articulate about his subject was 15 years old. And, um, and then, he, then we sort of discovered him and, and found him and um, he hadn't really told his parents um, what he was up to. And um, they just thought that he was you know, in his bedroom and they kind of did something with apps and God knows what else he was doing in his bedroom, but you know, they needed to get him out a little bit. And, um, and then uh, the first time he really told him was because he had to ask his mum to open a bank account, a proper one this time, because we were putting in uh, $300,000 into his company. And um, you can imagine his mum's surprise, especially since the person putting the $300,000 in is the ninth richest man in the world based in Hong Kong. So how in hell did you get to Hong this guy in Hong Kong? So the point of it is that if you're different and you stand out and you've really got a good idea, you are going to make it. And you are going to be able to do absolutely anything in this world. You can find anyone anywhere and you can put them together with the right approach and the right will. I do think, though, you do need to be different and you need to stand out. Um, there's still too many... Some of the businesses I've seen today so far still are a little bit uh, in the same space, like a little bit of a variation of something else. And, um, and that's not that good enough now when the competition's getting harder and harder. So I'm just going to give you a quick background about what we did. You know, in some ways, we're a startup. We're all a bunch of guys who came out of... Um, we've all had our own companies, we've all um, been pretty successful um, as investors and, and entrepreneurs. So we formed a group called Spike Labs back in 2012, and then the Accelerator and Soul First Class graduated in March um, 2013. Then we started our own $30 million seed fund in November 2013, and to date our Accelerator has invested in 23 companies in Asia, and our seed fund has invested in uh, 24 companies um, since, since November. And um, the partners are around the world. We have an approach that good businesses can go global very quickly these days, and investors are very local. And uh, so we have partners in Asia, the US, Israel, and, and London, and we help a European company go to US or go to Asia, Asia company go to the US, US company go to Asia. And um, we just invest, we don't take any extra fees, but that's our point of existing. Uh, and it's working really, really well. We've done um, really well. We do, talking of parties, wherever Cafe Split happens to be, we do like to party with our, with our companies. Um, 
This is after a particularly hard um, drinking session, and you can, if anyone's ever been to Korea, it's good drinking sessions, much like here, which is why I have a, a good affinity with uh, Eastern Europe. And, um, and everyone likes to party, and everyone likes to work hard. And it's a, it's a really good culture, and, uh, and it's something that you guys have a great culture here, right? You have a fantastic culture. You've got a lot of brains, fantastic universities, um, and there's this real interest in, uh, in, um, in what's going on out here. And I, I, I can just feel that the buzz is going to keep going and going and going and, um, and get there. As I said, like, we are now um, one of the, according to The Economist, a couple of months ago, we're there from um, 18 months, we've now become one of the top three accelerators in Asia in terms of follow-on funding. It's the only way to measure. Like, the companies go through an accelerator. How much money do they get afterwards? And it's a bit dark here, but this is in San Francisco, and this is um, all our US companies in San Francisco. And so, which we have very regular dinners, we, have, we bring in other investors, we bring in partners, we bring in business development people, um, which is what we see our role to be. Most investors, as you've heard a number of times, really just want mentors at the right advice, the right mentors, the right partnerships for them. Not some generic shit, but like, for me, this is what I've got, this is my problem, this is what I'm trying to do, and I want to get to it. So, we have a, a, a very strict thesis. Everyone, now, to talk about what's the buzz, one of the things, one of the big secrets in getting funding is try and be in a sector where all the money's going, at least even position yourself into that sector um, to where it's going. Investors are very much in the herd mentality. Once one big guy goes for it, everybody kind of piles in, and the money flows, and then it kind of flows out into another sector. But the things that people are really interested in now are the really big, big sectors, which are just at the start of getting disrupted. So the Internet of Things is a massive thing. It's bigger than mobile, it's bigger than the web, it's just, it is huge. It is billions and billions and billions and billions of devices. That is an incredibly interesting space. Not just the hardware, but all the connectivity, because it's all brand new protocols. This is not an Android and iOS play. It is a whole different ball game. And so that's a lot of interest from the connectivity viewpoint. Second thing, of course, health, finance, transport. Transport, Uber, drones, driverless cars. Those are the big things, but there's a hell of a lot that's going to be going in there to support those infrastructure. But transport's getting disrupted. Financial tech is getting disrupted hugely. And the great thing about this is that the reason why people are so interested, the other thing you must always think about is who is going to buy. This is not just a Google and a Facebook play. Internet things is Cisco, General Electric, Qualcomm, uh, Microsoft, HP. It is everybody. Finance, all the banks, health, all the massive health companies that are out there, the insurance companies. And then, um, and then as you start to get into advertising and social, that's the general stuff that's still going on. But the thing that's interesting about the other sectors is there are so many bigger players who are going to buy companies. And they're going to buy companies sometimes out of fear. And the fear is a great way of getting people to buy things. So I've gone through that. We basically are very, very focused that we think that Things everywhere will become smart and generate a lot of valuable data about consumer and business behavior. We also see super apps coming. So super apps where they start to gather in information. So they gather in the stuff not just on your, um, on your calorie counting, but on your fitness, off the vest that you're wearing that's telling you how it's going, off your lifestyle, off how you're feeling, off your psychology. There's a huge amount of things coming into these lifestyle super apps where they take in lots of feed and give you a more holistic lifestyle approach to what you're doing. Um, and then, as we said, you know, smart new financial services, payment mechanisms, digital currencies. I'm a big, big believer in cryptocurrency and a big believer in Bitcoin. Go to the valley and say you don't believe in Bitcoin. Even if you're doing something completely different, they're probably going to kick you out the door because nearly everyone else does. So they will ask you, do you own a Bitcoin? I, trust me, you'll probably get that answer. Question. And I would own a Bitcoin just for the fact that you can say you do. Like, they are, it is a very, very big movement, far bigger than anyone realizes. And then finally, you know, advertising, media, and social services will then continue to be more and more personalized. So what we've done is that we have, we have a very strict category where we 
We are looking for things into our categories and how they flow into things. So what I wanted to talk about a little bit was a little bit around what Mike was um, talking today and then actually quickly just uh, go for some questions. So how to scale. I think, you know, be different. You go, you know, I, Steve Jobs was always of, you know, incredibly obsessed about this, but it is very much be different. And um, if you really want to go big, you've got to be different. Now, you can be a clone of something that's in the US and hope that a US company will come and pick you up. Or you can be a little bit of a variation of something and hope that you can get some local traction and try to go somewhere. But if you go to the US these days with a, a story that is a bit similar to, I don't know, 100 other companies, it's going to be pretty difficult to get money. So, you know, this is, you know, this is, this is a quote which I, I, I just emphasize over and over again. Right? You don't want, you know, Jackie Chan doesn't want to be the next Bruce Lee, which is what he got called about all the time. Uh, he wanted to be Jackie Chan. And, you know, so if you... And I remember when Uber was pitching, Uber, Halo was first, Uber was second. But Uber, Uber had better software and they had a much better approach to their markets. And they were very different in the way they went after things. So while Halo had the software originally for um, taxi cabs, they went after the taxi cabs, while Uber realised it's much, much bigger than your standard taxi cab. So, I mean, just standing out and being different is really, is really critical. Um, the second thing is that I, I just, especially as you start to get into it, you've got to focus on design and user experience. The bar is getting higher and higher. You know, according, I, just to give you some of the scale, Babson, which is one of the you know, biggest business schools in the world, has done a report, and over 500 million people between the ages of 15 to 45 around the world in the top 20 countries have all indicated that they would like to thinking about becoming entrepreneurs. So you have to think that you are going to be part of eventually millions and millions of people going into business and you've got to stand out. I mean, it's much harder than it was four or five years ago. It's much tougher because there's just more and more startups all the time. And to stand out, you have to focus on design and, use, and user experience. And you've got to keep it simple. Nest is a superb example of a product which goes in from research and absolutely nails the user experience. Um, you've, you know, it's that vision. If you want to go somewhere big, you've got to nail that user experience. Um, so we invested in heavily into the Internet of Things. A lot of those companies you saw up there are Internet Things companies. Now, when I say Internet of Things, Internet of Things is much bigger than just a wearable. Internet things is about smart things, uh, dumb things becoming smart. I'm a big believer in anything that people use a lot that's dumb now and gets connected is an incredibly interesting um, generation of data. So we invested in, in November last year, before Nest was sold, we co-invested with Google and NEA and a lot of big players into a company called the Orange Chef, right? Talk about names. And, um, and they had a thing called PrepPad, and PrepPad is a smart kitchen scale, and it's, it's very, very clever. And this is what I mean by a dumb thing becoming smart and generating huge amounts of data. I'm just going to show you what it does. If keeping a close eye on nutrition is important to you, maybe you're trying to lose weight or training for a 5K, or maybe your doctor just recommended that you get more iron in your diet, then you don't have too many options when it comes to knowing exactly what's in your food. You basically have to rely on packaged foods with a nutrition label. That's where PrepPad by the Orange Chef company comes in. PrepPad is a smart kitchen scale that connects over Bluetooth to your iPad and uses a very cool app called Countertop to show you your food's nutritional balance based on weight, not labels, whether it's one ingredient or an entire meal. So how does it work? Well, the first time you open the app, you tell it a little bit about yourself, and the app will provide USDA nutrition recommendations based on your info, or you can set your own goals manually. When you place anything on PrepPad, the app asks you, what's on PrepPad? You can either search for the ingredient from Countertop's 300,000 plus food database, pick an item from your favorite foods for quick and easy access, or simply scan a barcode to let PrepPad know what you're placing on it. As soon as you put something on PrepPad and tell it what it is, you can see a breakdown of the calories, fat, protein, carbs, and all the vitamins and nutrients that are in that food. 
When you add or remove food from the scale, you can easily see the nutrition effect of each item. If you want to add something that needs a container, just put the container on the scale, and when PrepPad asks you what it is, tap the container icon. Then add whatever you want to the container and tell PrepPad what that is. The app will also show you how it measures up against your goals. The exterior ring is your target nutrition breakdown, and the interior ring is the actual food. The colored sections are for fats, carbs, and protein. You can adjust your meals so that the measurements from the inside ring align with your target amounts in the outside ring. You can also look at your balance score to see a numeric match to your nutrition goal. It's that simple to use, but you can also use it to measure the nutritional information of recipes. Let's say you make your favorite lasagna recipe from Williams Sonoma and add each item in the recipe to prep pad as you went. Once you've placed an item on prep pad, Countertop remembers it, so you can take things on and off the scale as needed without affecting your total meal summary. You can save your meal, add the name and description, even tell prep pad how many servings it was. That's what I really love prep pad for. You can get the nutritional information for any recipe you make, even if you make adjustments to it. Maybe add a little more cheese or omit the meat. PrepPad has it handled and you'll have accurate, true to your food nutritional information for what you cook. Your meals also get saved to your history in the Countertop app. So when you decide to have your favorite sandwich, you can put on PrepPad, go to history, and select it as an ingredient and PrepPad will give you all the nutritional information. PrepPad allows you to make real-time decisions about eating better. There's no pressure to use it every time you eat and no need to feel guilty if you missed using it. It's also an incredible teaching device for kids and a great way to get them involved in healthy eating and food selection. The point of PrepPad is to get the best balance from the food that is right in front of you and learn how to create meals and snacks that align with your nutrition goals. So um, that's, now, the great thing about that is it's not by the Orange Chef, that's by William Sonoma. So William Sonoma is the biggest um, home retailer in the US. Orange Chef is about a 14-month-old company now, and um, they shipped 40,000 units into William Sonoma. William Sonoma loved it because of the design. It's so simple, it's incredibly easy, and it's so easy that you can talk to whoever is, is cooking or using stuff at home. And so they have a huge campaign put behind it. It's because it is super simple. If you want to try and sell things into into the US market, you've got to be that slick, right? That was four, you know, those guys put that together in about 10 months, including the app and, and the product, and it is super slick. And everything, they've thought of the detail, they've really gone into the detail. And, um, you know, that's the type of competition that you're up against. So, you know, you've really got to, to focus. Now, the, the last couple of things I really wanted to have a quicker chat about was how Spotify scaled. So Mike was right, I mean, we waited. We waited for a very long time. Um, but there was a very clever way of doing things in Spotify. And um, it was planning. Everybody planned it very, very carefully. Now, we had a big problem with the labels. The labels didn't want to let Spotify into the US at all. And so, um, so uh, Daniel's um, number two was a guy called Shaquille Khan. And Shaq, what Shaq did is he went out to LA armed with international Spotify accounts. Now, Spotify wasn't allowed to be in the US, but he, as long as we paid for the accounts and actually paid for VPN access over Spotify to, um, into the US, it was okay, we got around it. So it became the hottest thing. Nobody had a clue who Spotify was, as some sort of Swedish startup. Um, but it became the hottest thing to play at parties. And all the artists, and everybody wanted to have a Spotify account, and Shaq just went around handing them out in Soho House in LA every, <laughs> every day. And he pinced at the labels, because you got all of the guys, the artists in LA were like to the labels, you need to let these guys in. And if he'd gone just head first into the labels, he, we, it would have taken much, much longer. So it's a real thought process. Think about if there's barriers to entry, you've got to think about how to get around them. Um, you know, bludgeoning your way straight into big corporations who sit in your way for some reason is not the right answer. Doing the way Spotify did is the right answer. And the other one I'm going to talk about is Mimi Box. Now, uh, Ushka and uh, Bella Beat will remember um, uh, Mimi Box because Mimi Box 
went into um, Y Combinator at the same time, and the top three that were voted in, in the latest Y Combinator class was Bella Beat, One Other One, and Mimi Box. Now, Mimi Box was the first Korean company to ever get into Y Combinator, and we got them in there. They went through our accelerator a year ago. They were tiny, and they started scaling, and they basically make Korean beauty products. Now, Asians in the world around love Korean beauty products. They think they're the best. So, Japanese, Asians in the US, Chinese, etc., all started ordering stuff from Mimi Box because it was the easiest way to get the Korean beauty products. Very smart, very targeted niche. These guys were really clever. They're all out of, um, like, either worked in um, Estee Lauder, Tom Ford, um, they'd, they'd basically worked in fashion and they worked in cosmetics. And um, so when we took them, um, we basically we did a, another big investment with them, and then we took them into, um, into Y Combinator, and they killed it, and now they've just raised a, a, a massive round. And again, you know, the way they did it was they've still got the team in, um, in, uh, in Korea, but the CEO is in the valley. Now, this is a one big thing. When I invest, I always ask the CEO, are you prepared to move the valley? You can start a business anywhere, but I think at some point, moving to the valley is a good thing for an exit perspective. At my previous firm, we also invested in Waze. And uh, Waze, you might know, was sold for a lot of money to Google. And we were very early investors in Waze. And um, the way Waze was, was there were three founders in Israel and a massive team in Israel. And the three founders were, were older, quite old. I mean, they were in their 40s and early 50s, actually. And um, they didn't want to go back to the US. They'd done that, and they had their families in Israel. So they were incredibly smart. They, they br brought in uh, Noam and put him as CEO in Palo Alto. That's a big, bold move. Very few CEOs have that thought process. And then he went around and he hired lots of great people in Palo Alto. And everyone in the valley thought it was a Palo Alto company. No, it's not. It's an Israeli company. In fact, the founders are in Israel. But the CEO is there. You cannot get away with it by putting a business development person over there and think that they will sort out the valley for you. Everyone sees through that in the seconds. And a lot of companies try to do that. The last thing I would do is it's just illustrating, like some founders think they are the best at marketing the best CEO, the best technical, the best PR, the best at everything. They are the worst, right? The best founders are the ones who go and hire much better people than they are and have the courage to, to hire them because your team looks sensational. Again, if you're pitching in the valley and you're trying to come across as the best of everything, they're too experienced. They're going to see you, at least the top tier firms will, they'll see through you in seconds. If you come there and you talk about the amazing team you've got, that's all they want to hear. So again, just those little lessons just to, um, to, to keep focused on. But uh, so I'm, I'm here. I'm really happy to be here. I'd love to answer any questions now. Parties, cafe, split, wherever that is until early hours of the morning. I'm you know, very keen to, to look at what we can do in, this, in the ecosystem here. I'm much more interested in Eastern Europe than I am in, frankly, France and, uh, and other places in Europe. So, you know, I think the best places in Europe at the moment, frankly, is, you know, frankly, UK, um, because the UK is a very big centre in fintech. Uh, you know, Scandinavia is big into gaming and media. And here, I think, because of the quality of people coming out of the universities, that hardware and data, data analysts, etc., data scientists, there's a big, big opportunity here um, for that type of um, big data technology. And I think that's a a big opportunity here for people if they want to take it. So, thank you very much. So, any questions? It's all perfectly clear. More a personal question. What is your dream? What do you want to achieve? What do I want to achieve? Um, you know, it's, that's a great question, mate. I, I, I just want to keep going. I mean, I love startups, and I love investing in startups. I've had a number of startups. I'll probably have another startup as well myself. But um, uh, I like to, um, to scale. Like, I believe that the, um, 
the ability to reach out, like Dave McClure is doing a fantastic job of this as well, and the ability to reach out across multiple, um, multiple early stage startups is something that I, I really enjoy doing, and, and to stay in the center of that was what I'd love to keep doing. Yeah. No, 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 definitely strategic partners. So I agree with you. Like, so when we were at Horizons, that was a Hong Kong VC firm. And we went into Israel, we invested into like 14, 15 companies, put 140 million in there without ever having anyone actually full time on the ground. And we did that by partnering with one of the best VC firms down there. And they wanted to be offering Asian investors to their startups. And we wanted to invest in Israel early because we could see. We were tired of the Valley valuations and the Israeli valuations were really good. So, yeah, I mean, I think doing the right partner is super important. You know, they know the ground. Yeah, it's the right way to do it. Trying to do it on your own is you know, not the greatest sometimes. So you're looking for eyes and their faces on the ground to work here in Australia? Yeah, I think, I'm actually in London, but, um, but, but more co-investors. So that metal there is, is a big VC who is investing into companies in their, set, in their market and wanted to bring global partners to their companies. So that's always the ideal situation, a co-investor who, who likes to bring other, other investors to the, to the table, which is always a good thing. Yeah. That's it. Sorry, man. So, so we're, we're quite similar to some other groups where the, we have the accelerator. The accelerator in um, Korea is very early stage. So that is where, exactly like, exactly like Y Combinator, we take between around 4, 5, 6% for $25,000. Early stage, help you, help, and, that's, and then we accelerate you through a three-month program. The three-month program, though, is very focused on helping the companies go outside of Korea or Japan. Um, and soon we'll be in Singapore. So it's helping you go outside. And then the fund is, uh, so the, it's, the fund is our money and some LP money, and it's, uh, so it's a $30 million fund, and we generally invest between two hundred to $500,000, but into, straight into the company. That's just our investment. So just a straight investment. Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah, just like others, we'll be taking a percentage of the company, whatever the valuation is. And then we hope the company will do very, very well, and we work very hard for that company to do well, because we won't make any money until that, company makes, until that company is either sold, goes to an IPO, or a massive investor comes in at around C or D and buys out the early investors. Yeah, that's how it generally works. Hopefully. I should be back, hopefully. Um, good, that's it. All right, thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it.